Right everyone, it's time to assemble around the dining table with your character sheets and dice trays because we're entering into the magical, shadowy, goblin-infested world of Dungeons and & Dragons and making a valiant attempt at appraising each and every video game based on Gary Gygax's venerable creation. Robes, cowls and wizard hats are optional, but gods help me, you'd better have brought snacks, we're going to be here for a while. The Dungeons & Dragons tabletop role-playing game has come a long way since its emergence back in 1974, where once it was seen as a venture purely for lonely, basement-dwelling males that sparked panic about devil worship in the hearts and minds of concerned, misinformed parents across America, the pastime has since grown into something of a wholesome phenomenon. Untold millions are playing all over the world, and multiple respected celebrities have confessed to throwing the odd D20 every now and then, too. Ever since video games were a thing, intrepid programmers were inspired by Dungeons & Dragons to create expansive adventures in digital form, and pretty much every game with any kind of RPG mechanic, from Final Fantasy VII to Cyberpunk 2077, owes its very existence to this dice-rolling institution. Of course, many of these digital adventures have carried the official D&D license, and for this list we've amassed a small army of them. Multiple campaign settings are represented too. From Eberron to Spelljammer and Alkadim to Planescape, we've got the lot. And if you know what all those words mean, then you've definitely come to the right place. Don't worry if you don't know, it'll still be fun. We won't be including mobile-only games on our list, and we're also omitting collections, re-releases and enhanced editions, instead judging each game on its original version. When deciding the rankings, we'll be looking at factors like critical score, player enjoyment, impact and legacy, paying particular attention to how well received the game was at the time of release. Right, with all of that official stuff out of the way, it's time to don a suit of studded leather armour and pray for those natural twenties because we're venturing forth into the vast and hazardous catacomb that is Dungeons & Dragons video games, and we're not sure what we're going to run into down there. D does anyone have dark vision? Let's rank them. I'm Dungeon Master Ben, and I'm Murder Hobo Peter from Triple Jump, and here is every Dungeons & Dragons video game ranked from worst to best. Number 69. Nice! Iron and Blood, Warriors of Ravenloft, PC and PS1, 1997. We're getting the dice rolling with this unlikely fusion of Dungeons and & Dragons and one-on-one -on -one 3D fighting games. Iron and Blood Warriors of Ravenloft was developed by Take-Two Interactive and draws from the spooky, gothic horror-themed Ravenloft campaign setting. Although Saturn and 3DO versions were reportedly planned, Iron and Blood Warriors of Ravenloft was released only for the PC and PS1, with the PS1 version going up against other weapon-based fighters like Battle Arena Toshinden and Soul Edge. Spoiler alert, by the way, it absolutely does not stand up to any of them. Some reviewers did note that the graphics were nice and detailed for the time, it had a chunky roster of eight heroes and eight villains to play as, and there existed an innovative mechanic where characters could learn magical abilities as they fought, but every other aspect of the game was critically panned. Jerky controls, dodgy animations and unhelpful camera angles all conspired to spoil the sword-slinging experience. The sound and voice effects were grating, and the fast-paced techno soundtrack often juxtaposed hilariously with the medieval fantasy action. Just listen to that. Some reviewers even claimed that they were able to beat the game by using just one button, handily illustrating that Iron and Blood Warriors of Ravenloft wasn't exactly rich in the technical and strategic departments. The idea of throwing down as various goblins, wizards, and other such D&D mainstays is an interesting one, but Iron and Blood Warriors of Ravenloft squanders this idea like a misaimed fireball spell. A critical miss. Number 68. Descent to Undermountain. PC. 1998. There are a few things about Descent to Undermountain that are remarkable. One is that a fellow named Chris Avalone was on the development team, which is a name I want you to try and remember as it will come up again. Another is that it was created using the game engine from 1995 FPS game Descent, which is apparently where its name partially comes from. 
The third thing to note is that it is undoubtedly one of the worst Dungeons & Dragons video games of all time. The adventure kicks off in Waterdeep, where the High Wizard Blackstaff tasks the player with assembling a party and exploring the infamous dungeon of Undermountain, which seems to be the cause of disappearances and other such suspicious activities. This all leads to a first-person dungeon delve filled with combat, loot, puzzles, and a gradually unraveling mystery to pick through. Alas, Descent to Undermountain was afflicted with multiple problems. Descent's engine proved to be entirely unsuitable for a dungeon-crawling RPG, and technical issues caused the developers no end of woes when getting it ready for retail. Shoddy graphics, poor AI, numerous bugs, and uninteresting gameplay all conspired to make this particular Descent a trip that very few people wanted to make. Developers Interplay even referenced how bad Descent to Undermountain was in their very own Fallout 2, which released a couple of years later. A Magic 8-Ball item could randomly state, yes, we know Descent to Undermountain was crap. Ouch. Number 67. Hillsfar. Amiga, Atari ST, C64, NES, and PC. 1989. Right, we're delving into the SSI Dungeons & Dragons games now, and there are a lot of them. SSI, or Strategic Simulations Incorporated, ran from 1979 until 1994, and in that time they released enough Dungeons & Dragons video games to fill a bag of holding. These games are difficult to rank, as they all use the same engine, work off the then-current edition of the D&D rules, and are very similar visually. Hillsfar came out at the bottom, though, and that's because most observers agreed that it was just plain boring. Players can choose between fighter, cleric, mage, and thief classes, and then visit the various guilds in the town of Hillsfar, accepting fetch-type quests, completing them, earning golden experience, and then eventually retiring. It was as riveting as it sounds, with reviewers of the NES version especially bemoaning the fact that it felt more like a series of chores than an adventure, and that the game consisted of accumulating gold while providing very little to spend it on. Hillsfar also features a certain equine interlude that drops it down our list another few places. Players are repeatedly forced to partake in an aggravating and unresponsive horse riding section where dangerous obstacles like errant haystacks, narrow streams, or passing birds must be avoided lest old chestnut goes bolting off into the wilderness. Suffer through this infuriating minigame enough times and you'll be ready to do the same. Number 66. Pool of Radiance, Ruins of Mithranor. PC. 2001. By the time 2001 rolled around, Dungeons & Dragons-based video games had really taken a step up in quality and scope, and the pressure was on for dungeon delving adventures released during this time to keep up with the new wave of Infinity Engine titles that brought D&D to a whole new audience. For Pool of Radiance Ruins of Mithranor, developers Stormfront Studios tapped into the historical significance of the Pool of Radiance name to create something both old and new, making their game the last in a series of formerly SSI-developed titles that began in 1998. The story concerns a scary and powerful Draco Lich, which is an undead dragon with necromantic powers, moving into the ruined elven city of Mithdranor and using it as a base to expand an empire. The player's party has been tasked by famous D&D wizard Elminster to head into the ruins and deal with the insidious threat one skeleton at a time. Unfortunately, said activity was deemed dull by most who took up the sword, with confusing and seemingly endless dungeons packed with barely distinguishable rooms and an over-reliance on mindless hack-and-slash gameplay turning off those used to more variety and spice in their adventures. The game also had a bug problem, and we don't mean giant spiders and ank eggs. The graphical glitches and save game issues were one thing, but when players are uninstalling your game and it's also wiping the PC system files, things have gone a little too far. Yes, it really did do that. Number 65. Spelljammer Pirates of Realm Space. PC. 1992. What happens when you take D&D staples like heroes and wizards, gnomes and beholders and other such fantasy fare and blast them off into space? No, not the terrifying and visceral effects of decompression. This is a fantasy realm, remember? The real answer is you get Spelljammer, the setting for the next title on our list, Spelljammer Pirates of Realm Space. In this intergalactic adventure, the player takes on the role of the captain of an interstellar ship and spends much of the early game running errands, delivering goods, defending space lanes, and taking out pirates, all while earning currency and reputation, before eventually being sent out on an important mission that kicks off the game's simple plot. Players can use spells and abilities in ship-to-ship -ship combat, where rival vessels will bombard each other with space catapults and 
against space ballistae and can also oversee boarding actions which result in more traditional D&D combat as the opposing crews come face to face in the ship's halls. It's an interesting premise, but it was handled somewhat clumsily, with clunky mechanics and lots of bugs and technical issues causing most publications to state that this particular space odyssey was one to miss. Developed by Cybertech but published by SSI, Spelljammer Pirates of Realm Space was one of the first so-called gold box titles, so named after their signature golden boxes, that threatened the veteran studio's long-standing reputation for quality output. It's not quite a black hole level catastrophe, but it was a planet-sized misstep for the once venerated series. Number 64, The Dark Queen of Kryn, Amiga and PC, 1992. Set primarily on the world of Kryn, the Dragonlance setting is a D&D offshoot with an even more dragon-centric flavour and an emphasis on moon-powered magic. Popular in the 80s and early 90s, it spawned a number of digital adaptations and the Dark Queen of Kryn is probably the least compelling. Not necessarily because it's the absolute worst, but because by the time this conclusion to the Gold Box Dragonlance series was released, gamers were expecting much more. In an attempt to portray the epic conclusion to the Kryn saga, developers Micro Magic Inc. focused strongly on combat, with the player's party eventually facing off against the dark goddess behind the planet's troubles. This, however, meant that less time and effort was put into exploration and role-playing, which disappointed many and made the game feel like a bit of a grind. With numerous bugs and glitches, a lack of balance in the combat leading to an unfair difficulty level, and its insistence on stripping back exploration and NPC interaction, the Dark Queen of Kryn proved to be a less than stellar climax to one of the less celebrated Gold Box series, and observers almost unanimously agreed that this was one to miss, with only the most dedicated D&D fans managing to battle their way through to the end. I suppose that by this point, this particular Dragonlance video game series was beginning to get a bit long in the fang. <laughs> Blimey. Number 63, Dungeons and Dragons Eye of the Beholder, Game Boy Advance, 2002. I've never really understood why people say beauty is in the eye of the beholder, because looking into the eyes of these things, there's really not much beauty there. Unfortunately, there's not much beauty in this GBA dungeon crawling experience either, with Pronto Games' Dungeons & Dragons Eye of the Beholder failing to live up to past titles that it borrowed so heavily from. Following a very similar plot to the far older home computer Eye of the Beholder games, Dungeons & Dragons Eye of the Beholder's story concerns the city of Waterdeep being threatened by the denizens of Undermountain. What this means for the player-controlled party is a trip into the sewers and tunnels beneath Waterdeep to root out the threat that builds there, and much sword-swinging and spell-slinging ensues. Played from a first-person perspective during exploration, the game switches to an isometric display for combat similar to the SSI Gold Box titles. Here, players can use spells and abilities from the four playable classes to fend off bad guys and continue the quest to save the city. While the idea of whipping your Game Boy Advance out of your pocket and embarking on a bit of dungeon diving on the move might be an intriguing one, Dungeons & Dragons Eye of the Beholder does not live up to such promise with the already dated nature of its gameplay compounded by an annoying and frustrating interface. Unfortunately, you'll be eyeing up one of your better GBA games within minutes of getting started with this one. Number 62, Eye of the Beholder 3, Assault on Mithdranor, PC, 1993. Eye of the Beholder 3 Assault on Mithdranor, like the previous two games in the trilogy, offered something a little different to SSI's previous fare, presenting its entire adventure from a first-person viewpoint, be that exploration, combat, or receiving exposition from beardy NPCs. It picked up the storyline directly after the series' second instalment, with the victorious party relaxing in a local tavern, extolling the patrons with stories of their heroism and attracting the attention of a mysterious stranger with an even more dangerous quest in store. Said quest is to invest investigate the ruins of the city of Mithdranor and swipe an ancient artifact from a powerful and dangerous lich. This third Eye of the Beholder title used an updated version of the previous game's engine and added some quality of life enhancements like an all attack button and the ability to use certain weapons in the second rank. What's it doing all the way down here in the rankings then? Well, unfortunately, the game just failed to live up to the promising framework built by its predecessors. Reviewers reported a downgrade in graphics and awful sound design and declared that this was no way to end an epic trilogy. One factor that may have impacted this is the fact that SSI chose to develop the game in-house, while the previous two titles were created by beloved developer Westwood, who would go on to define an entire genre with Dune 2 and Command and & Conquer. SSI should have beheld onto them, I suppose. I do, I do suppose that. Number 61. Birthright, The Gorgon's Alliance, PC, 1996. 
We're embarking on a journey to yet another D&D setting now with Birthright, an adaptation of the Dungeons & Dragons rule set where player characters are rulers of the land and gameplay is focused on political manoeuvring and acts of governance. As such, Birthright the Gorgon's Alliance takes on the guise of a strategy game with RPG elements where players oversee the rise and falls of nations from a position of sovereignty rather than skulking around in dingy dungeons with all the kobolds and gelatinous cubes. Sounds like an interesting diversion compared to all the usual dungeon delving, but Birthright the Gorgon's Alliance was poorly received by all but the most dedicated strategists. Taking on the role of a divinely appointed regent, the player's goal is to unite a continent, beating various third parties with their own machinations toward the throne to the punch. This can be achieved through war, diplomacy, trade, and even by magical means. That's not to say adventuring is completely done away with, because occasionally the regent will be forced to get their royal hands dirty with a bit of quest presented in first-person 3D, and there are even some basic battlefields to conquer. All these ingredients didn't add up to much, though, with poorly explained mechanics, ropey visuals, and overwhelmingly fiddly micromanagement souring most observers on what was undoubtedly an ambitious title. Birthright the Gorgon's Alliance made its play for the throne but came up short, and it now lies on the pile of forgotten, licensed D&D games with the rest of the peasantry. Number 60. Dungeons & Dragons Daggerdale PC, PS3, and Xbox 360, 2011. If I had to sum up Dungeons & Dragons Daggerdale, I'd say that it is the epitome of that PS3 360-era boring grey and brownness that often reared its ugly head back then, but you could probably tell that yourself from taking one look at it, so allow me to elaborate. Dungeons & Dragons Daggerdale was developed by Bedlam Games and features single-player and multiplayer cooperative modes with a focus on action-based RPG gameplay. Players had four character classes to choose from, and these characters could be customised during setup and by acquiring and equipping loot. The plot sticks the player in various environs around Daggerdale and puts them at loggerheads with the unscrupulous mercenary organisation known as the Zentarim. These rascals are trying to lay claim to the Daggerdale area using a structure known as the Tower of Void, and it's the player's job to stop them. Unfortunately, the Zentarim are probably going to succeed in their nefarious plans because very few players are likely to want to take up the call. Dungeons & Dragons Daggerdale was deemed a waste of the license and was called out for its boring quests, uninteresting combat, and dreary environments. Some reviewers did state that the game could be okay if you were able to play with friends, but I honestly wouldn't want to subject my friends to it. All that repetitive combat, boring dialogue, and dismal visual design, it's like being hit by a sleep spell. Number 59. Dungeons & Dragons Tactics PSP 2007 with a name like Dungeons & Dragons Tactics and with its home being Sony's PSP, you might expect this Kuju Entertainment developed title to be something akin to Final Fantasy Tactics War of the Lions or Tactics Ogre Let Us Cling Together. However, while it does share aspects like turn-based combat and grid-based maps with those titles, Dungeons & Dragons Tactics kind of does its own thing, not necessarily for the better. In the game, players assemble a party of adventurers and become embroiled in a clash between two mighty dragons who are vying for godhood, and gameplay switches between a simple overworld map where players can accept quests and choose their next destination, and dungeon exploration where the game makes use of a somewhat zoomed-in overhead view. When monsters are encountered, the gameplay switches once more into a traditional turn-based take on the D&D rules, where characters and enemies act in initiative order, casting spells and using abilities to affect the course of battle. It was a nice idea, and the story hook of a pair of opposed divinity-craving dragons was sure to turn a few heads, but Dungeons & Dragons tactics was executed so poorly that most adventurers who entered its dungeon turned around and walked right back out again. Just like the world that the game depicts, Dungeons & Dragons Tactics was beset by two terrifying god dragons, the dragon of frustrating interface design and the dragon of unhelpful camera angles. Between them, they laid waste to any enjoyment that might have been found within. Number 58. Shadow Sorcerer, Amiga, Atari ST, and PC, 1991. Another game in the Dragonlance series, Shadow Sorcerer, was developed by US Gold and presented most of its action in neat, isometric squares, which gives the title an odd, pixelated appeal even to this day. Simplified somewhat compared to the usual SSI-published fare, Shadow Sorcerer still offered a complex party mechanic and tough battles, with enemy encounters throughout the game's expansive world being generated randomly. The role-playing and plot elements were stripped back, with the focus firmly on guiding your party of four through squares of brightly coloured dungeons or wilderness, with 
with little to no NPC interaction to break things up a bit. It sounds alright if you just want to wade through hordes of hobgoblins, but even with the combat focus, these encounters still suffered from quirks that often made them annoying. Party AI would consistently mess up your best laid plans, and walking through doors in a dungeon into a pack of monsters would be fine if not for the fact that your squishy magic users had decided to take up the vanguard between this room and the last. Shadow Sorcerer also had a refugee mechanic, where the party were forced to guide a host of refugees to the fortress of Skullcap, and many players found this addition to be problematic. The refugees moved infuriatingly slowly across the map, and leaving them behind would see them wander off and get killed. An aggravating escort quest that lasts an entire game. I'll use my action to disengage, thanks. Number 57. Dragon Strike. NES. 1992. We're staying with Dragonlance for our next entry, and this time, instead of wizards, warriors, rogues, and clerics, we get to play as the big winged scaly boys themselves. The chance to play as a dragon in a Dungeons & Dragons setting is undoubtedly a cool idea, but the NES version of Dragon Strike, which is a completely different game to the home computer titles of the same name, is a little bit dull. Players can choose between bronze, silver, and gold dragons, with each one having its own strengths and weaknesses. Those familiar with D&D will know that metallic dragons are the friendly ones, and in Dragon Strike, the bronze dragon has the best armor, the silver dragon excels at speed, and the gold dragon possesses the strongest attacks. As the game progresses, the player engages in missions throughout the realm, facing off against rampaging chromatic dragons and eventually swooping down into a dangerous chasm where the Queen of Darkness waits in her multi-headed, draconic form. It all sounds very epic and looks decent for an NES shooter, but the actual gameplay rides a disagreeable line between frustrating difficulty and snooze-inducing boredom. The ability to change altitude adds a somewhat interesting gameplay wrinkle, and some boss battles can bring the excitement up a couple of notches, but in all, Dragon Strike for the NES manages to make flapping around as a massive dragon and blasting anything that moves with devastating breath attacks kind of forgettable. What a drag. And um, what a dragon. Yeah. Anyway. Number 56. Tales from Candlekeep, Tomb of Annihilation, PC, 2017. Candlekeep? I've been there before. That'll come up much later in this list, though. For now, we're talking about BCOM Studios' board game-inspired turn-based RPG, Tales from Candlekeep, Tomb of Annihilation. It's a decent-looking board game adaptation, with its detailed land and dungeon tiles suspended in a bizarre void, providing an interesting visual effect. And if you've played the Tomb of Annihilation board game upon which it's based, you'll be instantly familiar with it. However, Tales from Candlekeep, Tomb of Annihilation doesn't really offer much beyond this vaguely interesting initial impression. The game completely does away with certain role-playing aspects that you'd expect from a D&D game, like character creation and, you know, any semblance of role-playing. If you're playing Tomb of Annihilation around a table with a group of friends, you have the social aspect and the ability for stories to emerge naturally, but if you're playing it alone at your PC, the whole thing just feels empty. Observers also pointed out needlessly difficult mechanics, like starting combat with the party at a disadvantage for no reason based on the roll of a die, as well as ineffectual levelling and a poorly realised crafting mechanic. Some enjoyed the game for what it is, but Tales from Candlekeep Tomb of Annihilation has too many problems to be considered over countless similar, more capable offerings, and the fact that the game was abandoned in an incomplete state left a foul taste in the mouth too. Unfortunately, this tomb isn't really worth raiding. Number 55. Dungeon! Apple II. 1982. I love a name that gets straight to the point, but with this entry, we're doing anything but. The Apple II game, Dungeon, is based on a 1975 board game of the same name. Said board game was created by a fellow called David R. McGarry, but subsequent editions were worked on by Dungeons & Dragons alumni like Steve Winter and Mr. Gygax himself. The game also borrowed heavily from the mechanics of Dungeons & Dragons, so we'll call it a Dungeons & Dragons game, meaning that, by extension, the Apple II game, Dungeons, is a D&D &D game too, alright? We all agreed? We happy with that? Good, because that's our excuse for including a 40-plus year old game on this list anyway, and we're sticking to it. Dungeon, while looking to our modern eyes like a series of misplaced, garishly coloured squares and rectangles was a digital adaptation of the aforementioned D&D-adjacent board game. Players use the keyboard to move the square that represents their intrepid adventurer around the rectangles that represent dungeon rooms. The aim of the game was to win battles and unearth treasure, and when enemies are encountered, the game switched from top-down geometry to impressive for the time static images of epic confrontations as menu-driven conflict ensues. Dungeon is undoubtedly archaic, but it received a very warm critical reception at at the time, and it's nice to look back on the history of digital dungeon diving and see how much things have progressed since those days of basic shapes arranged on a grid. Yep, things have certainly moved on. 
number 54. Heroes of the Lance. Amiga, Amstrad CPC, Atari ST, Commodore 64, Master System, NES, PC, and ZX Spectrum. 1988. Hold tight, because we've got more dragons for you now with an extra helping of lances. Or lances. That's right, we're back in the Dragon Lance, Dragon Lance setting with Heroes of the Lance, which puts players in control of eight heroes as they delve into a ruined city in search of an ancient relic guarded by a villainous dragon and shakes the usual SSI recipe up a bit by offering side scrolling action with DD rules running things from behind the scenes. The eight heroes mostly act as lives for the player, with only three of them having any specific unique abilities like healing, offensive magic, or traversal spells. Some publications at the time were positive about this change of pace, and Heroes of the Lance sold pretty well too, but taken as a title on its own merits, the game isn't exactly a D&D highlight. Heroes of the Lance was notoriously difficult, and if a player were to approach it in the same way as an average side-scrolling action game, they would be immediately and severely punished. A lack of careful forward planning could result in a lot of heroes slain in a very short period of time, and a strategic approach was required. To add to this notorious difficulty level, players were unable to save their progress, which was something they had become used to in previous SSI D&D titles. Basically, if you managed to get through this one, you either had a lot of time on your hands, or you truly were a hero of the lance. Number 53. Dragons of Flame. Amiga, Amstrad CPC, Atari ST, Commodore 64, NES PC, and ZX Spectrum. 1989. Another game that explores the Dragonlance setting is Dragons of Flame. This title was also developed by US Gold and also eschewed traditional D&D RPG mechanics for a more arcadey, side-scrolling style. Its storyline follows on directly from Heroes of the Lance, and the previously mentioned Shadow Sorcerer completes the trilogy. The story of Dragons of Flame picks up with the party racing to beat a horde of evil dragon men to the fortress of Pax Tharkas and was a mild improvement over the original, with slightly updated visuals and certain quality of life improvements, like characters being restored to full strength before a transition into the side-scrolling dungeon crawling. The developers also worked to provide more intuitive menus, but this did little to solve the problem of crushing difficulty, and neither did the addition of two extra lives. I, I mean two additional heroes, they're people. They are people. The world of Dragons of Flame was also very difficult to navigate, demanding expert orientation skills from the player. The top-down exploration sections offered very little in the way of recognisable landmarks, and many wayward adventurers never reached the aforementioned Pax Tharkas thanks to the confusing map mechanics. Basically, if you were already a fan of the way Heroes of the Lance approached digital D&D adventuring, then Dragons of Flame offered more of the same with some minor improvements. If you like a bit more role-playing at a somewhat less sadistic difficulty level, however, then you should probably make your investigation check elsewhere. Number 52. Idle Champions of the Forgotten Realms. PC, PS4, and Xbox One. 2018. Wait, hang on, I thought we weren't doing mobile games. What? Well, it came out on PC and consoles too. Fine, okay, right, well, let's get it over with then. To be fair, Idle Champions of the Forgotten Realms is apparently a very decent example of the idle RPG genre. First releasing on Android and iOS and appearing on consoles and PC soon after, it allows players to set up their party of adventurers and take on wave after wave of enemies. Players can slay gnolls, direwolves, bandits, and the like by clicking on them and can acquire loot through the act of click slaying, which can then be spent on new champions or upgrading the existing party. Everything in the game refers to the D&D tabletop universe in one way or another, with adventures like the Curse of Strahd and Tomb of Annihilation referenced and a faithful map of the Sword Coast to explore. The game also seems to have a thing about cursed cows. Whatever moves you, I suppose I'm going to fire the writer for that one. At the end of the day, Idle Champions of the Forgotten Realms is an idle game, and as such, it can barely be described as a game at all. It's more of a thing that you click on, like a fidget toy in digital form. As we've already mentioned, though, Idle Champions of the Forgotten Realm is regarded quite highly in the realm of idle games, so if you like D&D and you like clicking on things, then this is probably a good thing to click on. Analysis. Number 51. Menzo Baranzan. PC. 1994. Menzo Baranzan is a really fun word to say. Go on, give it a try. Why not roll the R a bit, live a little? I actually don't know if I'm pronouncing it right, but it is fun to say, though. It is. It, it truly is. It's the name of a city located in the Underdark, inhabited by a cruel race of subterranean elves known as the Drow, and is also known as the City of Spiders. More fun to say 
than to visit then, yeah? The 1994 video game Menzo Baranzan is another SSI-published adventure, this one developed by Dreamforge Entertainment, who would go on to develop successful point-and-click horror games Sanitarium and sci-fi strategy title Warhammer 40,000 Rites of War. The story kicks off when an assortment of peaceful villagers are snatched by a drow raiding party, and a pair of intrepid heroes set off to track them down and bring them back. Playing similarly to the Eye of the Beholder titles, Menzo Baranzan offers an interesting visual style and some satisfactory dungeoneering gameplay, but ultimately falls short of its promise. Reviewers pointed out that the narrative took a long time to get going, that many of the game's dungeons felt empty and lifeless, and that the gameplay ultimately boiled down to repetitive hack and slashing. As well as the two-player created characters, additional allies could be encountered throughout the game, including the world-famous and unusually heroic drow fighter-slash-ranger Drizzt Doerden, whose name his creator, R.A. Salvatore, purposefully pronounces differently depending on the day of the week. Drizzt is kind of fun to say, but not as much fun as Menzo Baranzan. Baranzan. Menzo Baranzan. Let's move on. Number 50. Sword Coast Legends. PC, PS4, and Xbox One. 2015. One of the more recent games on our list, this action role-playing title puts players in the adventuring boots of a member of the Order of the Burning Dawn, a once-powerful guild with a shady past. The story of Sword Coast Legends casts players as a new recruit in this somewhat disreputable group, and kicks off when its members all start to experience strange and portentous nightmares. The actual gameplay is very straightforward, with the player controlling their group of adventurers from an overhead viewpoint, exploring buildings, dungeons and wilderness areas, slaying monsters and interacting with NPCs. It all looks fine, but a little unremarkable, and observers were pretty much unanimous in declaring Sword Coast Legends to be a somewhat generic RPG that stands apart only for its Dungeon Master mode. Said mode allows players to digitally mimic the tabletop dynamic, with one player taking the role of the omnipotent and omniscient overlord and the others living and dying according to their whims. Depending on the trustworthiness of the person in charge, Sword Coast Legends does have the potential to offer a great time for all involved, but even then, would-be Dungeon Masters expressed a desire for more depth to the tools available to them. If you're willing to work at it a bit and have some buddies to go adventuring with, there's fun to be had with Sword Coast Legends. But when it comes to the single-player campaign, this one just feels like it's coasting. Peter? Number 49. Stronghold, PC, 1993. Another D&D game developed by the prolific Stormfront Studios, this one offered something a bit different to the usual adventuring fair by tasking players with building and managing a thriving town in a fantastical kingdom. Unrelated to the 2001 Firefly Studios title of the same name, Stronghold has an old-school wireframe 3D visual style beneath which hides layers and layers of complex strategy and resource management. In keeping with the D&D theme, players can recruit mages, clerics, fighters and the like to act as leaders of various districts within the town, and these can be used to construct certain buildings or train the local militia to fend off monster attacks. Depending on your chosen alignment, the game will set different victory requirements, with lawful rulers required to reach the seat of Emperor to finish the game, while chaotic rulers need to rid the land of competitors by force. This can be done by amassing trained troops and sending them off on missions to remove hostile forces. The management side is just as involved, however, with food supply needing to be overseen and available buildings including markets, castles, and magic schools. While many players who became proficient in this complex Fantasy Kingdom simulator were quick to heap praise upon it, the fact of the matter is that Stronghold closed its gate to most players by demanding speedy mastery of its overwhelming complex set of mechanics and strategies in the face of mercilessly effective and efficient enemy forces. Have you ever heard of accessibility, Stormfront Studios? Number 48. Dungeons & Dragons Order of the Griffin TurboGrafx-16 1992. The TurboGrafx-16, known as the PC Engine outside of North America, was originally released in 1987 and had one Dungeons & Dragons game to its name. 
Dungeons & Dragons Order of the Griffin uses the Mistara setting, and sits fairly highly in the estimations of TurboGrafx-16 owners who want a good D&D adventure, although this may have been mainly because it was their only choice. Taking inspiration from earlier SSI games like Pool of Radiance, Dungeons & Dragons Order of the Griffin provided a decent step up in graphics and spectacle, but honestly, not all that much else. The plot, which concerns the return of an ancient vampire, undead popping up everywhere, and assassination attempts on local leaders, was considered to be somewhat overblown, and the same old gold box inspired gameplay was becoming very dated in the early 90s. Dungeons and Dragons Order of the Griffin did have some standout moments, but for the most part, it was a generic fantasy RPG that's remarkable only for being the single D&D game on the platform. Like a couple of other games on this list, it was developed by Westwood Studios, and the music was composed by legendary Command & Conquer composer Frank Leparkey. He has, however, stated in interviews that this was a low point in his career due to the limited capabilities of the hardware sound engine. So you probably shouldn't expect classics like Hell March and Act on Instinct from this one, okay? Number 47. War of the Lance, Apple II, Commodore 64, and PC, 1989. SSI's War of the Lance is another trip into the Dragonlance saga, but this time things are a lot more strategic, with the action playing out on a continental scale and the fate of kingdoms at stake. Players face off against the evil High Lord and his armies of rogues and monsters, and the campaign can either start at the very beginning of the conflict, with the player's task being to form the Whitestone Alliance and capture the enemy capital, or in medias res, with certain territories already occupied and various sieges and events already playing out. The action unfolds from a top-down viewpoint, with esteemed commanders presiding over an archaic but charming map and commanding their forces to march across land, voyage across oceans, and engage the enemy. It's not exactly a visual feast, but when you're agonizing over political and military decisions that could swing the tide of a continent-spanning conflict, who wants to be distracted by dazzling effects and sparkly animations? <laughs> not me. War of the Lance, while unsuccessful commercially, reviewed well at the time, and those who adopted the game sang its strategic praises, with many still claiming to boot it up once in a while, even today. A few things do hold it back, however, including a lack of replayability and longevity compared to the SSI RPGs, so I wonder why anyone is still booting it up, to be honest, and the simple fact that more recent grand strategy games completely eclipse it in both scale and spectacle. It's not exactly Total War, after all. Oh, Total War D&D. Now there's an idea. Number 46, Forgotten Realms Unlimited Adventures, PC, 1993. If you've ever been a tabletop dungeon master, you'll know that sometimes the most enjoyable aspect of Dungeons & Dragons is creating interesting adventures for your friends and seeing how they interact with them. It can be a fascinating and rewarding experience, but just be careful when you're talking about it in public. The term Dungeon Master can mean different things to different people, after all. Forgotten Realms Unlimited Adventures offers digital DMs the chance to shake their creative dice, being an SSI published toolkit for players to create their own adventures in the vein of the Gold Box SSI RPGs. We say in the vein of because Unlimited Adventures doesn't use the Gold Box engine thanks to some contractual complications with TSR, meaning users could almost make their own Gold Box games, but not quite. Unlimited Adventures enabled the creation of dungeon modules and the importing of custom sprites and artwork. There were limitations, such as the inability to change the walls, backdrops, and title screens, but these were more or less addressed by a healthy modding community, making Unlimited Adventures an expansive system for budding Matt Mercers. However, it wasn't all creative sunshine and dungeon mastery rainbows. Some observers claimed that the game's tools were overly complicated, and not everyone was impressed with the visuals. That being said, Forgotten Realms Unlimited Adventures was about the best dungeon creation tool available at the time, and at least provided an interesting alternative to sketching out treasure rooms and trap-filled corridors on grid paper. 
Number 45, Eye of the Beholder, Amiga, Mega CD, PC, and SNES, 1991. Back to those floating, ocularly endowed fellows now as we explore the first game in the Eye of the Beholder trilogy. Developed by Westwood Studios, Eye of the Beholder riffed heavily on 1987's Dungeon Master, which is confusingly not D&D related, but also represented a new direction for Dungeons & Dragons titles, and impressed reviewers at the time with its visuals and atmosphere. The adventure kicks off in the city of Waterdeep, where the player's party are hired to investigate an evil that seems to be lurking underground. When the party first enters the sewer tunnels beneath the cobblestones, their exit is blocked by a cave-in caused by the Beholder, known as Xanathar, who still maintains a significant presence in D&D to this day, and the adventurers are forced to journey deeper past untold dangers to a confrontation with Old Eyeballs himself. Despite offering gameplay as deep as its dungeons and some welcome variety in locations to explore, Eye of the Beholder had its detractors. Interface problems, brutal difficulty, occasionally awkward combat, and an abrupt ending were all identified as issues that held the game back, and some reviewers even claimed that it was too similar to the aforementioned Dungeon Master. Of special interest is the 1994 Mega CD version that used an anime art style for the character portraits and had a unique soundtrack co-composed by Yuzo Koshiro of Streets of Rage fame. Not many dungeon adventures are backed by hardcore 90s techno, let me tell you. Number 44, Secret of the Silver Blades, Amiga, Commodore 64, and PC, 1990. Some proper classic gold box gaming now, with Secret of the Silver Blades, which was a follow-up to SSI Originals, Pool of Radiance, and Curse of the Azure Bonds. Observant viewers will notice that neither of those games have been mentioned yet, and after congratulating you on your successful perception check, I shall explain why this is the case. Firstly, by the time 1990 rolled around, fans and critics were expecting a little more evolution from the franchise, which Secret of the Silver Blades simply did not provide. Secondly, for this game, SSI decided to cut down on the role-playing and exploration aspects, instead focusing more on combat, which resulted in a lack of variety and made the whole thing feel like a bit of a grind. That said, a few upgrades were squeezed in. Secret of the Silver Blades provided players with the largest world to explore in a gold box game to date, and some minor graphical improvements were welcomed. The title also gave players the option to alter the encounter difficulty, and in the brutal world of low-level D&D, this was definitely a good idea. Secret of the Silver Blade was enjoyed by most who played it, and it doesn't exactly embarrass the franchise or drag it screaming into Avernus, but it does mark a time when the gold box games were starting to become a little stale, and certain reviewers began throwing the word boring around. Oh well, I suppose I never will find out what was so secret about those blades. Number 43, Dungeons & Dragons Dark Alliance, PC, PS4, and Xbox One, 2021. Dungeons & Dragons Dark Alliance is a recent title that clearly wanted to ignite the interest of fans of classic D&D adaptations with its Dark Alliance subtitle and its Icewind Dale setting, but also wanted to entice modern gamers with its accessible, action-focused approach. Allowing single-player or cooperative gameplay, Dungeons & Dragons Dark Alliance offers four playable characters to choose from, and sets adventurers off on a quest in the frigid tundra of Icewind Dale. Selectable characters include previously mentioned Drow Hero, Drist, and other R.A. Salvatore created characters like the Archer, Catty Bree, and the Barbarian, Wolfgar. However, while the involvement of Mr. Salvatore might indicate a focus on epic storytelling, Dungeons & Dragons Dark Alliance's premise fails to conjure much interest, and this isn't the only way in which it doesn't live up to the D&D name. Reviews were generally mixed, leaning towards the low 50s, and issues like mindlessly repetitive gameplay, an abundance of glitches, and bad AI compounded the title's averageness. 
being a recent game, it's obviously a lot easier to pick up and play than a lot of the difficult and esoteric titles from D&D's past, but when the gameplay loop is so mind-numbing and repetitive, it's tough to recommend it with so many great alternatives out there. It's fun for a few hours of absent-minded goblin slaying and loot grabbing, but Dungeons & Dragons Dark Alliance ultimately falls short of its more hallowed and venerated predecessors in almost every way. Number 42, Slayer, 3DO, 1994. We've called out a few games on this list so far for taking the focus away from the role-playing and concentrating entirely on combat, but this doesn't always have to be a bad thing. Lion Entertainment developed 3DO exclusive D&D title Slayer makes no claims of providing opportunities for fancy role-playing, no romancing of winged elves or hobnobbing with the lords and ladies of Waterdeep here, just running around a dungeon really fast slaying stuff. Throwing concepts like storyline and party mechanics out of a fifth floor castle window, Slayer encourages players to explore generated dungeons from a first person viewpoint with a feel that has more in common with Wolfenstein 3D than Dungeon Master. Much faster paced than the majority of dungeon crawlers, Slayer still uses the D&D rule set behind the scenes, but feels a lot more action packed, and the generated dungeons and variety of classes to play as offered some decent scope for repeated play. While sorely lacking in the audio department, and not offering anything too unique or spectacular to fans of either the FPS or RPG genres, Slayer was regardless seen as a reasonable attempt at a more action-focused D&D adventure, and stands as a surprisingly decent addition to the 3DO's comparatively limited game library. You know, with its frenetic pace, unapologetic tone, and dark imagery, Slayer kind of reminds me of that one heavy metal band. You know the one. Begins with an S. <laughs> yeah, you got it. Some 41. Oh, speaking of which, number 41, Death Keep, 3DO and PC, 1995. We're sticking with the 3DO for the moment, as the next title on our list is Death Keep, a 3D dungeon em up in a similar vein to Slayer. Also developed by Lion Entertainment, Deathkeep kept that Wolfenstein-like gameplay while expanding the overall experience with a graphical upgrade and a larger world than its predecessor. Reviews of the 3DO version were generally very positive, with commentators enjoying the step up in scope offered by Deathkeep, as well as the graphical leap and the atmospheric sound design. The plot, which concerns a dangerous necromancer taking up residency in an unreasonably large castle, was considered fit for purpose and entertaining enough, and the three playable characters, a dwarven fighter, an elven mage, and a half-elven fighter-slash-mage, all provided a distinct experience. Positivity aside, though, Deathkeep did have a few structural weaknesses. While some players enjoyed the challenge it offered, others found it objectionably difficult, and many considered the controls to be imprecise and fiddly. Though the game's size and interesting dungeon design did go some way to making up for these missteps. The overall pacing is also brought down somewhat by the 1996 PC port. Sorely lacking compared to the 3DO original, the PC version of Deathkeep suffered from blocky graphics, poorly implemented controls, and inferior sound quality, putting the game well behind the likes of first-person dark fantasy title Hexen, which was released a year earlier. Honestly, when it came to Deathkeep, most PC owners would have been happier if the 3DO crowd had death kept it. Number 40, Al Qadim, The Genie's Curse, PC, 1994. It's time for the video to take on a tone of exotic mystery now, as we examine the one and only game on our list based on the Arabian Nights inspired Al Qadim campaign setting. Whisking players off to Zakara, also known as the Land of Fate, Al Qadim, The Genie's Curse puts players in the role of a young corsair in a land of sand and scimitars, and represents a welcome oasis of variety for those used to SSI's standard fantasy fare. The driving force
source behind the storyline is a mysterious plot to free genies from their masters across Saqqara, and events kick off when a hurricane causes the player character's bride-to-be to be washed overboard in a shipwreck. The young corsair is blamed for the disaster, and must clear his name while also working out who's been liberating the genies from their itty-bitty living spaces. In an attempt to make the game more accessible, SSI and developer Cyberlaw Studios decided to simplify many of the mechanics, heavily streamlining character creation and making use of context-sensitive icon commands. This approach achieved mixed results, with many reviewers claiming that al Qadim the Genie's Curse cleverly and effectively blended RPG and adventure game mechanics, while others claimed that the game ended up lacking in both departments and that it was unlikely to appeal to either hardcore RPG fans or casual gamers. So, is al Qadim the Genie's Curse an Arabian fright or a stroke of genie-us? Only the wisest vizier could decide that. Or you. You could decide that. Number 39. Dungeons & Dragons Warriors of the Eternal Sun Mega Drive 1992 the only D&D game to be released on the Mega Drive, Westwood's Dungeons & Dragons Warriors of the Eternal Sun attempted to combine exploration, turn-based battles, real-time combat, and first-person dungeon crawling into one big sun-baked package. The adventure has a tantalizing setup that's worthy of any tabletop D&D session. A fortress town and all of its inhabitants are mysteriously transported to a bizarre other world, surrounded by impossibly high cliffs and bathed in the odd glow of a throbbing red sun. This new land is home to Beastman and Lizardman tribes and other stranger things, pun very much intended, and it's the player's job to amass a party and explore this uncanny new world. The story remains interesting throughout, and when the people of the kingdom start being slowly driven mad by the titular sun and begin to turn against the party, things really get juicy. However, the game's difficulty and inaccessibility to new players means that very few people will ever see it through to the end. With an unintuitive interface, esoteric mechanics, and punishing early encounters, Dungeons & Dragons Warriors of the Eternal Sun proved to be a tough nut to crack, but those willing to put the effort in did report some enjoyable adventuring once things got moving. Alas, with more accessible RPG favorites like Phantasy Star 4 and Shining Force 2 available on the Mega Drive, this particularly sunny adventure ended up spending most of its time in the shade. Number 38. Blood and Magic PC 1996 Released during a boom period for the real-time strategy genre, Blood and Magic was an attempt by developers Tachyon Studios to get in on the strategy craze with some Dungeons & Dragons licensed action. The gameplay revolves around Blood Forges, which are magical wavy squares capable of creating vast armies. These Blood Forges are used to generate Basil Golems which can then be used to fight or explore the map and gather resources, or can be changed into buildings or more powerful units. The game's single-player content consists of five campaigns and a final mega-campaign in which the player must conquer all 15 of the game's maps. The main campaigns allow the player to choose from two opposing forces, like the armies of a barbarian lord who's just usurped a kingdom, or the necromancer who's coming to avenge the death of said kingdom's fallen king. This approach added longevity, and players who were enjoying this top-down take on D&D had lots to keep them occupied. Blood and Magic was fine in the gameplay department, with reviewers failing to find much to nitpick about when it came to controls and mechanics. However, with the likes of Warcraft 2 and Command and & Conquer dominating the RTS landscape, the game was doing very little to stand out, and proved to be only an adequate RTS when the gaming world was full of great ones. There was plenty of bloodshed here, but it just lacked that little bit of magic. Number 37. Champions of Kryn Amiga, Apple II, Commodore 64, and PC 1990. Champions of Kryn is the first in a three-part series of Goldbox RPGs based on the Dragonlance campaign setting 
we already talked about the series finale, the Dark Queen of Kryn, earlier in the video. Honestly, Champions of Kryn isn't massively superior on paper, but it was the first in the Dragonlance trilogy, and so it offered something new, and it also had more adventuring and roleplaying opportunities, which Dark Queen of Kryn stripped back in favour of combat. As such, it's a pretty well-regarded title for the most part, and represents the SSI Goldbox games in a decent light. The story kicks off in an outpost near a hobgoblin city, and concerns a sinister draconian called Martini. Wait, no, sorry, Miatani, who steals an ancient and powerful tome. At the behest of an important fellow named Sir Carl, who is presumably always accompanied by his companion Sir Lenny, the player-created party go off to investigate this dragon man and bring him and his forces to justice. Reviewers praise the game's story and adventuring aspects, and the advanced Dungeons & Dragons guided combat and character creation were still nicely doing the job at this point, but the visuals were seen as dated, even with the newly tapped Dragonlance setting allowing SSI to put a different spin on things. Companions of Kryn is an example of a good SSI D&D RPG oh God, that's a lot of letters, but not an example of a great one. There are plenty of better gold box experiences out there, making this one hard to champion. Number 36, Death Knights of Kryn, Amiga, Commodore 64, and PC, 1991. Time to complete the SSI Dragonlance trilogy now with Death Knights of Kryn. Often the second entry into a trilogy can be the most run-of-the-mill, without either a bombastic opening or climactic finale to keep things exciting. But Death Knights of Kryn appears to be an exception to this rule. It's not a massive step up over the other games in its series, but it does just about pip them to the post. Combat and character creation are almost exactly the same, with a couple of minor quality of life improvements and the introduction of the Paladin character class, but according to reviewers and fans of the Dragonlance setting, Death Knights of Kryn feels much more a part of that world than its predecessor, thanks in part to the inclusion of some familiar characters. The story picks up after the defeat of Mirtani, and this time focuses on some worryingly frequent attacks by hordes of the undead led by reanimated heroes. These hordes are even bolstered by an undead Sir Carl of Champions of Kryn fame. Oh, Sir Lenny is going to be devastated. Eventually, the party will face the villain behind all of these grave problems, the evil Lord Soth whose goal is to possess the body of legendary Dragonlance hero Sturm Brightblade. It's all decent, fantastical stuff, and Death Knights of Kryn does just about enough to stand out as the best of its trilogy, but in the wider world of D&D adaptations, it still remains entombed in the crypt of mediocrity. Number 35, Pools of Darkness, Amiga and PC, 1991. As the fourth and final game in the first Gold Box RPG series, Pools of Darkness made some important steps in advancing the state of SSI's output. The graphics took a jump in quality from predecessor Secret of the Silver Blade from a measly 16 colours to a whopping 256, but it was also far larger in scope, with high-level skills and equipment opening up expanded possibilities and a journey that took players beyond Faerun. The story is suitably epic too, with Bane, the evil god of terror, hate, and tyranny, sending his lieutenants to cause trouble, destroy things, and plunge the land into darkness, and the heroes of the piece tasked with seeking out and defeating these lieutenants before going after Bane's most powerful servants in the plain of Acheron itself. It is truly a quest suitable only for experienced and celebrated heroes, so it's a good thing that players can bring their party across from the previous games complete with all of their gear and weapons. Although the game does force the party to abandon said weapons whenever they go plane hopping, which was seen as a bit of a kick in the teeth. Still, despite its issues, Pools of Darkness is another example of a perfectly adequate gold box RPG that impressed at the time while not being all that memorable today. That being said, classic D&D fanatics may well find that those murky pools are still worthy of a dip. Just remember to bring a towel. 
Number 34. Gateway to the Savage Frontier, Amiga, Commodore 64, and PC, 1991. Look, the mid part of this list is going to consist of a lot of similar looking SSI published gold box style RPGs, and you're just gonna have to deal with it, I'm afraid. We said we were gonna rank every single Dungeons and Dragons video game, and by crikey, that means all of them. Next on the list is the Beyond Software developed Gateway to the Savage Frontier, which brings in that villainous mercenary organization known as the Zentarim again. And this time, they're trying to conquer the titular Savage Frontier and take it for themselves by opening a route for their armies through an otherwise impassable desert. The game starts, as with many great adventures, in a tavern, where a nefarious evildoer slips something into the party's food and drink, and then steals all of their stuff while they're incapacitated. Left with nothing but the emergency gold they kept under their pillows, the party must purchase basic equipment and then head off on an adventure filled with wizards, clerics, and magical statues that hold the key to travelling safely across the aforementioned impassable desert. It was another decent gold box RPG. The formula was getting stale even back then, but it did add some welcome polish to the mechanics, and the new setting, the barely civilized but resource rich frontier, offered somewhere new to explore. Gateway to the Savage Frontier didn't exactly push out into new frontiers of gameplay, but it was another safe bet for fans who just wanted more of the same. Number 33, Treasures of the Savage Frontier, Amiga and PC, 1992. No, we're not letting you head back to civilized lands just yet, as it turns out that the Savage Frontier has more adventure to offer. Again developed by Beyond Software and releasing only a year after its predecessor, Treasures of the Savage Frontier's story picks up just after the conclusion to Gateway to the Savage Frontier, and initially concerns the heroes mopping up the last of the Zentarim troops in the region. Of course, things don't go smoothly, as the Zentarim and their allies have maintained a stronger foothold in the area than was initially evident. Capturing some high-ranking local ambassadors and blaming it on the party, the bad guys set into motion their plans to sow discord among the alliance of local governments and weaken the region so they can try to conquer it once more. The player spends most of the game trying to clear the party's name by doing quests for local lords, and then there's a seemingly unrelated quest at the end where the party fights a dragon for its treasure, presumably because someone remembered at the last minute that the word treasure was in the title. Like its predecessor, Treasures of the Savage Frontier was seen as one of the more polished gold box games and continued series traditions while changing very little. The formula was good, but getting stale and people were moving on, but Treasures of the Savage Frontier was a decent way to end the gold box RPG series, even if said ending was quite overdue. Number 32, Dark Sun, Wake of the Ravager, PC, 1994. It's time to introduce you to a new Dungeons & Dragons campaign setting now with Dark Sun. Set in the post-apocalyptic world of Athos, the Dark Sun setting tasks players with surviving in magic-ravaged deserts with limited resources and dreary living conditions. Try to imagine The Lord of the Rings if it was directed by George Miller and its story was heavily influenced by the effects of the 1973 oil crisis. The introduction of the Dark Sun setting to SSI's D&D output was welcome, and Dark Sun Wake of the Ravager continued with the story of its 1993 predecessor with a mysterious dragon and its powerful second-in-command planning to overthrow the City of Tyr. Looking visually distinct from SSI's previous offerings, Dark Sun Wake of the Ravager successfully communicates its post-apocalyptic setting with desert shanties and nomad settlements replacing mystical forests and mighty fortresses. Gameplay was evolved too, with a top-down view replacing first-person dungeon crawling and isometric combat, and battles in this fantastical wasteland unfolding at a much quicker pace. You'll find this game's predecessor a little ways up the list, so why did this follow-up end up trailing behind? Well, unfortunately, Dark Sun Wake of the Ravager was itself ravaged by an abundance of bugs, from the irritating to the game-breaking which somewhat soured the game's reception and locked many players out from ever discovering what the dragon from the intro sequence was even up to. I can tell you this much, it probably had something to do with ravaging. Number 31, Dungeons & Dragons Heroes, Xbox, 2003. 
Developed by Hunt Valley Studio, Dungeons & Dragons Heroes is a co-op multiplayer hack-and-slash with RPG elements exclusive to the Xbox. The story follows four heroes who were killed 150 years before the events of the game by the wizard Caden, who managed to cast one last deadly spell before being vanquished. The wizard returns in the present day and quickly resumes his evil ways, and so the four heroes are revived to stop him once again. But maybe try not to die this time, hey guys? The heroes, who can be named by the player, make up the classic RPG party combination of fighter, cleric, wizard, rogue, and each hero has an ancestral weapon that can be improved throughout the game. They also have unique abilities that can be upgraded as the game progresses, adding that aforementioned element of role-playing to all the hacking and slashing. Similar in style to Dungeons & Dragons Dark Alliance and Dungeons & Dragons Daggerdale, Dungeons & Dragons Heroes received comparable comments from reviewers. Lacking in depth and role-playing opportunities, but good for a bit of mindless hit-things-until-they-die gameplay. However, this Atari-published effort sits higher than those other games because while they offered adequately distracting hack-and-slash gameplay at best, this game, by most accounts, offers actually quite good hack-and-slash gameplay. Play. Huh, one of the best D&D console hack and slash games that doesn't have the name of a certain bustling port city in its title then. That's worth celebrating, right? Number 30. The Temple of Elemental Evil, PC, 2003. In tabletop terms, The Temple of Elemental Evil is an adventure designed by Gary Gygax for the Greyhawk Dungeons & Dragons setting. Feared and revered in equal measure, the adventure starts off in the delightfully named Village of Homlet, and concludes with an epic dungeon crawl through the titular temple, where players will eventually face off against fungus-faced demoness Zugtamoy. The Temple of Elemental Evil video game, developed by Troika Games, who are more well known for Arcanum of Steamworks and Magic Obscura and Vampire the Masquerade Bloodlines, is a digital version of that self-same infamous tabletop adventure, starting players off in that village of Homlet, the name of which is really making me crave a fried, foldy, eggy treat, and ultimately sending them off to Zugtamoy's domain. Played from a top-down viewpoint, the game shares many similarities with the Infinity Engine D&D games that were enjoying success at the time, but incorporates a radial menu system for spell and ability selection. It was generally seen as a pleasing old-school RPG with a neat graphical style, but a lack of multiplayer, a bug-ridden initial release, and very few true standout moments meant that it failed to live up to either its inspiration or the studio's previous work. The Temple of Elemental Evil should have been an epic retelling of one of the most infamous D&D adventures of all time, but ended up being somewhat forgotten compared to many of its contemporaries, its temple doors remaining closed to all but the most fervent of adventurers. Then, Number 29. Dungeon Hack, PC. 1993. Dungeon Hack is a first-person dungeon crawler from Dreamforge that gives players only a single adventurer to create and focuses almost entirely on exploration and combat, with little attention given to lore and role-playing. Inspired by the Eye of the Beholder games, Dungeon Hack initially appears to be a stripped-down version of those titles, but in place of party mechanics and a story hook, it offers roguelike gameplay that's fairly unique among D&D video game adaptations. When a new game is started, Dungeon Hack will generate a random dungeon, with publishers SSI claiming around 4 4 billion possible layouts, which is a hell of a lot of dungeon crawling. Too much, if you ask me. Players could affect the difficulty by influencing the number of traps, puzzles, and powerful enemies generated, and proud dungeon creators were also able to share seeds so that specific dungeon layouts could be swapped among friends and acquaintances. Or maybe enemies, if you manage to generate an especially devious hellhole. <laughs> Dungeon Hack also allowed players to go full roguelike with the addition of an optional permadeath setting that mercilessly erases all saves associated with that character once they fall afoul of some sneaky trap or unexpected monster attack. The game was well received at the time owing to the fact that it delivered exactly what it promised, a near endless utopia of content for digital dungeon delvers more interested in combat mechanics than role playing. But to anyone else, it just felt like Eye of the Beholder with bits hacked off. Number 28. Fantasy Empires, PC, 1993. 
Another strategic take on the Dungeons & Dragons theme, Fantasy Empires tasks players with expanding their territory, overseeing battles and making truces in a bid to conquer the world of Mystara. The game was created by Silicon Knights, who are best known for beloved Lovecraftian GameCube horror title Eternal Darkness Sanity's Requiem and controversial Xbox 360 action RPG Too Human. Fantasy Knights was only the studio's second title, but was well received for its solid gameplay and addictive strategy even if things did get a little drawn out as campaigns reached their later stages. Players choose a traditional D&D character at the start of the game, but instead of heading off into dangerous forests and trap-filled temples in search of monsties to bash, the character will instead lead the player's armies, affecting proceedings by using the skills and spells provided by their class. In their efforts to claim the entire map, players can invade neighboring provinces, build and upgrade infrastructure on their own lands or train various troop types if the appropriate buildings are present, including human, orc, dwarf, and shadow elf units. Multiplayer campaigning is included, but the AI is more than capable of stepping in if no like-minded pals are available. Another aspect of Fantasy Empires that received praise was the Dungeon Master, the ever-present wizard who leans over the screen and observes proceedings, occasionally chiming in with wizardly advice. I just wish he wasn't watching all the time, though. That stern expression gets me all flustered. <laughs> Number 27. Eye of the Beholder 2 – The Legend of Dark Moon – Amiga and PC 1991 if old-school 3D dungeon crawlers are your thing, then Eye of the Beholder 2 The Legend of Dark Moon is probably the highlight when it comes to officially licensed Dungeons & Dragons fare. While not quite the pinnacle of the genre, the game still provides a hearty and varied adventure backed up by charming presentation and a decent story with a memorable conclusion. The premise of Eye of the Beholder 2 The Legend of Dark Moon has that musty, undead scent about it, with the party tasked by the Archmage of Waterdeep to investigate the Temple of Dark Moon, where a shady high priest with a very very scaly secret is raising a legion of skeletons to do his bidding and lay waste to the land. Nice. In order to overcome this evil, the party will need to defeat nefarious clerics and their various monstrous underlings, as well as overcoming trials to access the temple's inner sanctums. Eye of the Beholder 2 was praised for its graphical style, its atmospheric music, and its spooky sound effects, with gameplay and interface design that was easy to get to grips with and built on the foundations set by the original. Don't expect to have it all your way in the depths of the Dark Moon Temple, though. The egregious difficulty level meant that countless adventures ended unceremoniously and prematurely in some dark, monster-filled hallway, and getting attacked in real time while frantically clicking through spellbooks isn't exactly the epitome of carefree adventuring. Overcome these obstacles, however, and an enjoyable adventure awaits. Number 26. Advanced Dungeons & Dragons Cloudy Mountain in Television 1982 Listen, we're well aware that Advanced Dungeons & Dragons Cloudy Mountain doesn't look like much by today's standards, what with the Intellivision more or less incapable of rendering things like clouds and mountains, but we're all about respecting our ancestors here at Triple Jump, and this right here is the first officially licensed Dungeons & Dragons video game, and for the time, it was regarded very highly indeed. I promise, look at it. It looks amazing. Developed by Mattel and released only in North America, this pioneering title gave Intellivision owning Adventure is the chance to play as a bow and arrow wielding hero on a quest to restore a shattered crown, exploring randomly generated dungeons and filling slinking enemies full of spiky arrowheads. Gameplay switches from a large overhead wilderness map with the player's starting point on one side of a vast mountain range and the titular cloudy mountain standing majestically on the other, and the aforementioned mazes that are created whenever the player enters a mountain tile. The speed of the creatures found in these mazes increases depending on the selected difficulty level, and arrows are finite, so can Serving and locating additional ammunition is essential for progression. For the most part, Advanced Dungeons & Dragons Cloudy Mountain was heavily praised by contemporary reviewers, with many publications giving it top marks and only the game's lack of a real ending and tenuous links to its source material garnering any negative comments. It's probably still quite fun to play today, as long as you're prepared to let your imagination do the rendering. God, it's gorgeous though, look at it! Number 25. Advanced Dungeons & Dragons Treasure of Tarmin in television and Aquarius. 1983. Mattel's second dip in the advanced Dungeons & Dragons well resulted in an upgrade from top-down, maze-based stickman adventures to first-person dungeon-based, slightly more detailed stickman adventures. Mattel's advanced Dungeons & Dragons Treasure of Tarmin was a very different game to its predecessor, offering faux 3D visuals and turn-based combat. This time, the player's goal is to explore the underground lair of a powerful Minotaur, acquiring powers and defenses throughout the lair's labyrinthine halls before finally 
finally facing the big purple horned fellow himself and making off with his treasure, not Spyro, not Spyro. Matters are complicated somewhat, with the player having to manage two types of health, war and spiritual, with different enemies affecting different health counts and different food types having varying chances of regenerating one or the other during rests. There are also different weapons, armors and items to collect as well as points boosting treasures to acquire. Like Cloudy Mountain before it, Advanced Dungeons & Dragons Treasure of Tarmin impressed reviewers with gameplay and visuals the likes of which had never been seen before on the Intellivision and observers appreciated the added complexity and variety of creatures to encounter in the Minotaur's halls. It may not look like much today, but in 1983 this was enough to whisk young adventurers into a world of thrilling exploration and challenging encounters in a deep and intimidating dungeon environment. Deep, intimidating and very, very green. Maybe the Minotaur likes to live in slime-coloured corridors. A Slimator, if you will. I won't, but maybe you will. Number 24. Dragon Strike. Amiga, Commodore 64 and PC. 1990. We've already spoken about the NES version of Dragon Strike, the top-down shoot-'em-up that was released in 1992, but now it's time to turn our reptilian gaze to the home computer version that is seen as something of a hidden gem among dragon aficionados of the era and takes the form of a 3D first-person dragon piloting sim. Another Westwood-developed D&D experience, Dragon Strike used fractals to create a faux 3D landscape for players to pilot their draconic mount around the skies of Kryn, taking on airborne enemies like Manticore, and other dragons and avoiding pesky archers on the ground. Players could straddle a bronze, silver or gold dragon, affecting not only the powers available to them but also certain mission parameters and even the ending. All of the endings are good though, after all metallic dragons are the good guy dragons. Any D&D player worth their salt knows that, as I mentioned earlier. Pay attention, come on now. Dragon Strike won many fans in the gaming press upon release, with commenters praising the game's innovation and highlighting thoughtful gameplay that rewarded strategic play rather than swooping in to every situation and solving every problem with overpowered breath attacks. Retrospective looks at Dragon Strike have lamented its lack of impact compared to its quality, and while it's not going to hold up against the flight sims of today, the word remake has been thrown around by some wishful thinkers. We wouldn't be against it, or at least someone should make a Dragon mod for Microsoft Flight Simulator. How is that not already a thing? Number 23. Neverwinter Nights. PC. 1991. Go on, admit it. Some of you started to seethe then, didn't you? Well, don't worry, fans of early 2000s Bioware RPGs, there are two games called Neverwinter Nights, so you can relax. For now. This time, we're discussing the Neverwinter Nights that was released in 1991, and while it may look very similar to the many, many SSI RPGs you've already seen on this list, this particular title has a very legitimate claim to fame. It was the first MMO to have graphics. That's right. Up until this point, massively multiplayer online RPGs had been text-based MUDs, or multi-user dungeons, and the developers at Beyond Software were the first to bring visual representations of environments and characters into the fledgling medium. The gameplay was very much in the mould of the existing SSI Gold Box games, but the online element added that human factor that made it unique, and player-run guilds and events kept things new and exciting for subscribers. Initially, Neverwinter Nights servers could support 50 players each, but this this number increased over the game's six-year run, and by 1997 it routinely hosted up to 2,000 players during prime time hours. Laughable figures by today's standards, but Neverwinter Nights was a trailblazer and its legacy cannot be denied. Unfortunately, those interested in MMO history can no longer play it online, but if you know the necessary cantrips, you can get it running in offline mode. Feels a bit lonely though, so maybe stick to one of the newer games, yeah? Number 22. Baldur's Gate Dark Alliance. Game Boy Advance, 2003. Well, here we are, 48 entries down, and we finally arrived at the video gaming capital of Faerun, Baldur's Gate. The prosperous and influential Merchant City's first appearance on this list is somewhat compacted, though, as it's the Game Boy Advance version of Baldur's Gate Dark Alliance that we're looking at for the moment. This handheld adventure kicks off when the protagonist is forced to evacuate his family's farm due to repeated bandit attacks and heads to the titular city to find protection within its walls. The city offers just as many dangers as the wilderness, however, and the hapless refugee is soon ambushed by mysterious attackers. Rescued by the City Watch, he ends up in the Elf Song Tavern where he is quickly employed in that most traditional of low-level adventuring activities, killing rats. 
poor rats. While offering more limited character creation than its console brethren – players can only choose from a human male, wizard, fighter, or archer – and stripping back some gameplay and features so that the adventure could fit onto Nintendo's handheld, Baldur's Gate Dark Alliance for the GBA was still well received. Players enjoyed the isometric hack-and-slash gameplay and the opportunity to explore a variety of locations, and the GBA rendition of the city itself was densely packed and filled with characters to interact with. Simplistic but fun, Baldur's Gate Dark Alliance for the GBA offered an entire entertaining handheld adventure that players could easily fit into their explorer's packs in between the 50 feet of hemp and rope and the tinderbox, of course. Number 21. Neverwinter. PC, PS4, and Xbox One. 2013. It's time to head back to the city of Neverwinter, so named because even though it resides in the chilly north of Faerun, the river that flows through it is kept in a constant state of summery warmth thanks to a bunch of fire elementals living under a nearby mountain. Cryptic Studios' 2013 game Neverwinter is an MMORPG that was originally released on PC before making the leap to consoles. In it, players create their character, choose from one of eight playable classes, and then jump into an online world where they can party up with others or go it alone. Neverwinter has more of a story focus than most MMOs, and the developers aimed for the game to feel more like a multiplayer Dragon Age or Oblivion rather than a Guild Wars or a World of Warcraft, and there's even a Foundry mode where users can create their own quests and stories. Neverwinter is not without its flaws, and uses a free-to-play model with purchasable perks which won't appeal to everyone, but the overall attitude held by reviewers is that it's free and it's good, so players have nothing to lose by giving it a go. It should also be noted that the title made a successful transition to console platforms with Xbox and PlayStation-centric pundits sharing similar levels of enthusiasm. You know, if I lived in Neverwinter, I think I'd spend most of my time paddling in that toasty river heated by fire elementals. I'll leave the adventuring to someone else, thanks. Number 20. Dungeons & Dragons Dragon Shard PC 2005 it's time for another strategy game with a D&D &D twist now, but this one tries extra hard to mix in those role-playing elements with the focus switching between a squad-based RTS while above ground and more of a party-based RPG when the player ventures underground. Dungeons & Dragons Dragon Shard was developed by Liquid Entertainment and is set in the world of Eberron, where multiple factions clash for the titular Dragon Shards, powerful artifacts linked to three legendary dragons. Two of these factions, the Order of the Flame and the Lizard Folk, have campaigned with a third faction, the Underworld Elves, known as the Umbra Gen, playable on skirmish maps. Players can choose from various champion characters who offer unique abilities and army bonuses, and will then be tasked with exploring the map and overwhelming enemies. Buildings are available, but can only be built in predetermined locations, and troops can be upgraded using resources and experience. When transitioning underground, gameplay swaps to a separate map. The player is limited to only a few units, and things switch up from battlefield control to dungeon crawling. It's quite a nifty mechanic, and gave Dungeons & Dragons Dragon Shard something unique to single it out amongst the RTS masses. The game was enjoyed by players and reviewers, who appreciated the artful blend of RTS and RPG, although the disappointing lack of an Umbragen campaign seemed more like the result of time constraints than developer choice, and the existing campaigns were seen as a little too short. Still, at least it won't drag on. Hey? Hey, Peter? Hey? Number 19. Dungeons & Dragons Online PC 2006 Originally known as Dungeons & Dragons Online Stormreach, before later being rebranded to Dungeons & Dragons Online Erebon Unlimited and then finally changing its name to just Dungeons & Dragons Online, this popular MMORPG was originally developed by Turbine, before responsibility was passed to Standing Stone Games amidst some awkward legal action. The game has also gone through a few publishers, with Atari, Codemasters, and Warner Brothers all getting involved before current publishers. Daybreak Games Company took up the helm. Dungeons & Dragons Online has been enjoyed by innumerable internet adventurers consistently throughout its tumultuous past, with its eight expansions adding hours and hours of content, and the game moving over to a free-to-play model in 2009. The gaming press has generally had good things to say about the long-running MMO, with the character customization and the quality of the game's quests receiving praise, as well as the massive variety in locations to explore. Fans of Dungeons & Dragons lore will be especially enamored with the wealth of content, with settings like the dark and gothic Ravenloft and the technology-infused Eberron to explore, and the game's MMO status meaning that it can all be enjoyed with friends just like real D&D. 
Admittedly, it's starting to creak a little in the visuals department, and the occasional glitch can still do more of a number on your party's progression than a sudden Tarask attack, but what's an adventure without a little real-life peril to keep you on your toes, right? Number 18. Dark Sun Shattered Lands, PC, 1993. As unlikely as it sounds, given the Dark Sun setting's reputation for cloying heat and choking sand, Dark Sun Shattered Lands represented a breath of fresh air for D&D gamers who'd been overexposed to the same old SSI fantasy RPGs for most of the 80s and 90s. Playing very similarly to its aforementioned follow-up title, Dark Sun Wake of the Ravager, Dark Sun Shattered Lands gets the rub because it provided a new setting for gamers to explore upon release, and was more or less free of all those nasty bugs that plagued the second game. The story is an intriguing one, with a powerful sorcerer king of a mighty city-state looking to make a massive blood sacrifice by putting nearby free cities to the sword. The player's party begins the adventure as gladiatorial slaves, and must fight to escape their bonds before attempting to put a stop to the nefarious Sorcerer King's plans. Reviewers appreciated the game's detailed graphics and user-friendly interface, and praised SSI for setting off into new territory, and so a new series was born. While we're on the subject, now seems like a good time to mention that there is another Dark Sun video game, a secret 70th entry to this list. 1996 MMO Dark Sun Online Crimson Sands was reportedly enjoyed by those who explored its post-apocalyptic world before its servers were shut down. However, very little concrete information is actually available, and absolutely no footage of it appears to exist anymore. As such, we were unable to rank Dark Sun Online Crimson Sands, owing to it being buried in the Crimson Sands of Time. Number 17. Forgotten Realms Demon Stone PC, PS2, and Xbox, 2004. Releasing in the same year as Baldur's Gate Dark Alliance 2, Forgotten Realms Demon Stone tried to muscle in on some of that D&D licensed hack and slash goodness, and to be fair, it did a fairly decent job of becoming a worthy adventure in its own right. Featuring an exciting storyline penned by none other than R.A. Salvatore, Forgotten Realms Demon Stone initially puts players in the shoes of a fighter called Rannick, who soon picks up a pair of adventuring companions before inadvertently free a couple of warlords who had been imprisoned in a demon stone. Escaping the warlord's wrath, the three decide to do the right thing and embark on a quest to stuff the bad guys back inside their spherical red prisons. The game is a fast-paced action role-playing affair with some great-looking graphics for the time, enjoyable voice acting and dialogue, a rousing musical score, and some cool cinematic set pieces. All of these factors combine to make a surprisingly enjoyable adventure that's fallen into relative obscurity next to the more treasured Dark Alliance titles from the era. That's not to say it wasn't without its faults, though. The game was hampered by a tendency to become very repetitive, and could be soundly beaten in a matter of hours, but it's still recommended for a quick D&D-themed action RPG blast, and was perfect for adventurers who'd finished the Dark Alliance games, but still craved more action-packed dungeoneering. Despite its somewhat ominous name, Forgotten Realms Demon Stone definitely deserves to be remembered. Number 16. Baldur's Gate Dark Alliance 2, PS2 and Xbox, 2004. The sequel to the game that first brought Baldur's Gate to consoles, Baldur's Gate Dark Alliance 2 provided another dose of the polished dungeon crawling offered by its predecessor, allowing players to choose from five playable characters with varying classes and combat styles, and focusing its campaign in and around Baldur's Gate itself, which is under threat from our old foes, the Zentarim. As the hacking, slashing, and questing continues, the party and the Zentarim realize they have a mutual enemy, the powerful vampire Mordok, 
who actually comes super close to realizing his villainous plans, transporting an evil tower to Baldur's Gate, renaming the city to Mordok's Gate, and turning all of its citizens into mind-controlled zombies. With its exciting and impactful storyline, entertaining co-op gameplay, the varied playstyles offered by its cast of protagonists, and its preservation of all the positive aspects that made its predecessor so well regarded, Baldur's Gate Dark Alliance 2 pleased fans. However, revered developers Black Isle Studios didn't really add much to the new recipe, instead content to focus on using the existing mechanics to just spin a new yarn, making the game seem more like a continuation than an evolution. Still, this well-received sequel was mostly considered a success, offering existing fans a new and exciting campaign with hours of addictive hack-and-slash gameplay, not to mention a chance to once again visit the mighty city of Mordok's Gate. Sorry, Baldur's Gate, that teleporting zombie tower is still having an effect on me. Number 15. Pool of Radiance. Amiga, Apple II, Commodore 64, PC, and NES. 1988. We're getting towards the business end of the list now, so it's time to take off our plumed paladin helms and our stealthy rogue hoods, and pay our respects to one of the games that started it all. While Pool of Radiance was predated by the two Intellivision D&D titles, this venerable adventure was the first entry into SSI's Gold Box series of RPGs, and ushered in a new era of computerized D&D roleplaying that helped to shape decades of digital dungeon crawling. Obviously eclipsed by later role-playing adventures, Pool of Radiance was still something of a revelation at the time, and a cause for celebration for D&D players who were wishing for a professionally produced single-player adventure to play on those long 1980s nights. It was very well received upon release, and did huge numbers for SSI, with even the Pool of Radiance hint guide reportedly outselling any of the publisher's previous games. Reviewers were throwing terms like best RPG around, and review scores rarely dropped below 80%. Switching between first-person exploration sections and top-down battles, Pool of Radiance's quest tasks players with aiding in the rebuilding of a once-great trade city known as Flan. That's Flan with a PH, by the way. There won't be any custard-based treats in this monster-infested ruin. Lack of tempting dessert dishes aside, though, Pool of Radiance will forever be the progenitor of the Gold Box series, and will be remembered as an RPG with a huge impact on the direction of the genre. In my opinion, that makes it sweet enough. Number 14. Curse of the Azure Bonds. Amiga, Apple II, Atari ST, Commodore 64, and PC. 1989. The follow-up to Pool of Radiance, Curse of the Azure Bonds expanded on the original game's ideas and mechanics by providing additional character classes and spells, and adding an extra level of polish. The adventure kicks off with the party waking from a magical sleep in the town of Tilverton, with all of their belongings stolen, and in a story beat that will resonate with anyone who's ever gotten a drunken tattoo, the party also discover that they've acquired some fetching sparkly blue markings on their arms. These are the Azure Bonds, and much of the ensuing quest is centered on getting rid of these cursed symbols in a world devoid of laser tattoo removal technology. The Bonds are revealed to be the work of a cabal of evil organizations who've cooked up a scheme to mark the local hero contingent with the titular symbols, giving said evil organizations control over the party's actions, and leading to some interesting and unsavory situations. The story hook was intriguing and Curse of the Azure Bonds improved upon its predecessor, compelling fans to spend their money just like the Azure Bonds compelled the game's protagonists to perform unspeakable deeds. As a top-notch gold box title from before the series started showing signs of stagnation, Curse of the Azure Bonds delighted press at the time, and is still respected to this day. In fact, you know what? This game's so good, I might just get a tattoo of it. Oh, oh wait, no, hang on, that's probably a bad idea. Number 13. Baldur's Gate Dark Alliance. GameCube, PS2, and Xbox. 2001. When the Baldur's Gate series first debuted on consoles in 2001, it was quite different to the top-down, real-time, with-pause RPG antics that PC gamers had been used to. 
Using a three-quarter top-down rotatable camera and presenting action RPG hack-and-slash gameplay, Baldur's Gate Dark Alliance was compared to the Diablo games by many observers, but offered an enjoyable and well-crafted experience in its own right. Kicking off the adventure in Baldur's Gate itself, Baldur's Gate Dark Alliance tasked players with choosing from the three pre-made characters and setting off on a quest to defeat the ominously named Eldrith the Betrayer, a once loyal general who previously served Baldur's Gate and now plans to take wrathful vengeance on the city. Developed by Snowblind Studios, Baldur's Gate Dark Alliance was praised for its high-quality hack-and-slash gameplay and tight controls. Seemingly a labor of love, the title offered a wide range of enemies to defeat, weaponry to defeat them with, and a general high standard of production that made it one of the best action RPG titles around. The Xbox and GameCube ports that followed the PS2 original did drag the overall score down slightly, with the Xbox-centric publications disappointed that their version didn't make use of the console's extra processing power, and GameCube owners incensed that their version suffered from an inexplicable drop in performance. Luckily though, Baldur's Gate Dark Alliance was still really good regardless of your platform of choice, and there was enough armor-sundering, loot-plundering fun for everyone to enjoy. Number 12. Ravenloft Strahd's Possession, PC, 1994 While we're done with the gold box titles, we're not quite finished with SSI-published RPGs, as Dreamforge's Ravenloft Strahd's Possession is next on our list, and represents the SSI RPG formula being used at its atmospheric best. The Ravenloft D&D campaign setting takes place in a dimension known as the Demi Plane of Dread, which is composed of multiple spooky domains ruled by entities called Dark Lords. The setting focuses on the more horror-centric side of the grander D&D universe, meaning players should expect fewer goblins and kobolds and more undead horrors and eldritch abominations. One of these Dark Lords is Strahd von Zarovich, and in case you hadn't guessed, he's a vampire. In Ravenloft Strahd's possession, he gets himself involved with a plot to steal a holy symbol from Lord Delt of the land of Elturel, and the player's party find themselves in Strahd's domain of Barovia, unable to escape due to an impenetrable poison mist. With its gothic horror atmosphere, Ravenloft Strahd's possession offers a delightfully creepy alternative to the high fantasy of its contemporaries, and pleased those who liked their adventuring with a generous helping of dreary spookiness. While the game was called out for its clumsy interface, Ravenloft Strahd's Possession was still lauded as one of the very best D&D video games at the time, delighting fans and press with its gameplay, intriguing storyline, and atmospheric music and sound design. A little clunky by today's standards, this supernatural soiree still proved to be an eerie treat for contemporary connoisseurs of creepy content. Number 11. Ravenloft Stone Prophet, PC, 1995 Another game that makes use of the Ravenloft setting, Ravenloft Stone Prophet steps away from all that Transylvanian-style spooky stuff and focuses on the Egyptian-style spooky stuff instead, with foreboding castles replaced with desert ruins and mummies stepping in for vampires. The game still possesses that traditional Ravenloft horror theme, but things are a lot more sunbaked this time around. Trapped in the harsh and dangerous deserts of Harakia, the player-controlled party this time find themselves up against an evil, undying pharaoh and his appropriately Egyptian-themed minions, with the land of Elturel once again under threat as the Sandy Domain encroaches on its borders. While Ravenloft Strahd's possession was appreciated by almost all who reviewed it, Ravenloft Stone Prophet was near universally seen as a step up, offering a less buggy experience, as well as a fresh setting that was enhanced greatly by appropriately thematic music and atmospheric sound design. The gameplay and combat were on point, and the well-written plot compelled players to keep plumbing the depths of those labyrinthine temples and ancient monuments in search of answers. The game wasn't perfect, with some still lamenting the interface and others complaining of an ending that didn't live up to the quality of the rest of the game, but despite these issues, Ravenloft Stone Prophet was fresh, well put together, and filled with ancient mysteries to uncover. As far as the SSI-published D&D adaptations go, we think that this one sits at the top of the pyramid. 
number 10. Icewind Dale, PC, 2000. All right, settle in, people, because things are getting really serious now. As we enter into the top 10, we also encounter our first Infinity Engine game. When BioWare created the Infinity Engine in the late 90s, they ushered in something of a resurgence for Dungeons & Dragons-style RPGs. The top-down RTS-like gameplay replaced SSI's familiar static combat maps and first-person exploration as the go-to for computer role-playing games, right up until BioWare themselves introduced the fully 3D Aurora engine in 2002. We'll get to that later, though, as this is Icewind Dale's time to shine. Developed by Black Isle Studios, Icewind Dale offered a more combat-focused adventure than its fellow Infinity Engine titles, with enemies encounters forming the vast majority of gameplay with relatively little in the way of investigation or interacting with party members. In fact, the entire party is created by the player, offering plenty of scope for customization and experimentation, but robbing more narrative-minded Infinity Engine fans of the well-written and engaging allies that Icewind Dale's bigger siblings were known for. Still, Icewind Dale's gameplay, music, and presentation all hit the mark, and the game's combat and mechanics focus meant that players who were interested in building a powerful party and testing its metal against the toughest foes the Frosty Tundra could offer we're sure to have a great time. Those looking for inter-party conflict, fire-forged friendships, and possibly even a spot of romance would sadly have to look elsewhere, though. Sorry, Ben. Number 9. Dungeons & Dragons Tower of Doom Arcade and Saturn 1994 We've had our fair share of RPGs, hack-and-slash games, and the odd strategy interlude, but how many of you were expecting a side-scrolling beat-em-up to make it into our top 10? We're not just putting it here for shock value either, as Capcom's 1994 arcade hit Dungeons & Dragons Tower of Doom is a top-notch example of its genre, and offered something completely different for fans of D&D video games. Combining D&D's western, medieval fantasy setting with Capcom's arcade flair and distinct visual style, Dungeons & Dragons Tower of Doom sends players on a mission to save the land of Mistara from a multi-pronged organised monster attack led by the nefarious and spooky arch-lich Deimos. Not only did Dungeons & Dragons Tower of Doom provide mechanically sound four-player beat-em-up action, it also provided unexpected depth, with numerous secrets to find and seven levels to fight through. The developers even remembered the game's role-playing origins and sprinkled story encounters and equipment shops throughout the adventure. Also released on the Sega Saturn in Japan as part of the Dungeons & Dragons collection, this arcade beat Beat'em Up isn't going to be to every D&D enthusiast's tastes, but when reviewers are claiming that it is in equal quality to genre greats like Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles and The Simpsons, it has to be recognised at the higher end of our list. Also, the kobolds look and sound like armed Yorkshire Terriers, which is both hilarious and adorable. Look at them. Number 8. Dungeons & Dragons Shadow Over Mistara Arcade and Saturn 1996 then, there was the sequel. Hitting arcades a couple of years later, Dungeons & Dragons Shadow Over Mistara did everything the original Capcom coin-op did, but bigger and better. Two more player characters were added, with a thief and a magic user joining the cast, and the story continues directly on from its predecessor, with the party realising the previous antagonist, Deimos, was just a pawn in an even bigger bads game. The evil sorceress, Sin, is the new threat, and she's another one of those characters with a really scaly secret. Seriously, watch out for those, everyone bloody got one. By taking the original and improving on it, Capcom rolled another natural 20 with this action-packed follow-up, and the game received fervent praise across the board. The developers continued to push the envelope of 2D graphical capabilities, more story branches and additional endings were added, and controls and mechanics were tightened up, expanded upon, to create a sublime, monster-bashing experience. Often hailed as one of the greatest examples of the beat-em-up genre, Dungeons & Dragons Shadow Over Mistara is the perfect game for those who still want their Dungeons & Dragons fix but are a little worn out by all those stuffy RPGs. Go on, forget about that stat rolling, extensive dialogue trees and character sheets for a while, and just enjoy some good old button mashing instead. Let your elven hair down. Please refrain from poking the shopkeepers though, they are most definitely not for sale. Number 7. Neverwinter Nights 2 
PC 2006 What do Neverwinter Nights 2 and Star Wars Knights of the Old Republic 2 have in common? Well, both games were developed by Obsidian Software, both were sequels to a Bioware-developed predecessor, and both are generally seen as inferior to said predecessor, but not by much. The most common complaints regarding this 3D role-playing sequel concerned a number of aggravating bugs that affected things like AI pathfinding and camera operation, and many of them persisted after numerous patches. These programming nuisances were enough to drop Neverwinter Nights 2's overall score below that of the original game, but Obsidian's sprawling adventure is still considered one of the classics. Allowing players to create their character from a selection of 16 races and 12 classes, with an additional 17 unlockable classes becoming available, Neverwinter Nights 2 provided epic scope for varied gameplay and replayability, and even gave players the opportunity to play the campaign cooperatively online. The campaign was definitely the game's strongest point, specifically its expert crafted story littered with tough, ethical choices, with game director Chris Avalone using his experience with previous D&D adaptations to craft another one of gaming's all-time great yarns. Remember when I mentioned him all the way back in entry number 68? Talk about a reversal of fortunes. Great job, Chris. Like Star Wars Knights of the Old Republic 2, Neverwinter Nights 2 is a great game that stands in the shadow of its beloved predecessor, but it deserves to be celebrated in its own light. Come to think of it, this seems to be Obsidian's thing. Number 6. Icewind Dale 2 PC 2002. Back to the Infinity Engine now, with Icewind Dale 2, another Black Isle Studios developed RPG that provides even more of the combat focused, pointing and clicking RPG gameplay that its predecessor delivered so masterfully. The last Infinity Engine game to be released, Icewind Dale 2 proved to be a more than respectable send off. Once again, the player creates the entire party at the beginning of the game, and this time said party are identified as mercenaries who have been shipped in to defend the harbour town of Targos from a besieging goblin army. As the situation escalates, the party find themselves wound up in a war between the ten towns of Icewind Dale and an overwhelming enemy force known as the Legion of the Chimera. What Icewind Dale 2 lacks in detailed NPC and party member interaction, it makes up for with varied and interesting tactical combat, adapting the mechanics of third edition Dungeons and Dragons into digital form and giving players near unlimited tools to overcome their enemies both mundane and mystical. A well presented and sublimely balanced combat RPG with great music and sound design, Icewind Dale 2 only came up short when compared to its legendary contemporaries. Of the five games remaining on this list, four of them had been released within three years of this game's emergence, and as such, it had already been bettered in almost every way. Still, it's one of the best around for tactical goblin zapping combat though, and you've got to respect that. Number 5. Neverwinter Nights, PC, 2002. Bolstered by the success of their earlier Infinity Engine games, Bioware were able to pour vast resources into their first foray into the 3D RPG world. They chose to name Neverwinter Nights after the groundbreaking 1991 MMORPG due to the fact that they wanted it to work as a possibility-filled multiplayer framework with users able to host over 60 players in online sessions. Neverwinter Nights also came packaged with the powerful Aurora toolset, which gave would-be dungeon masters the ability to create multiplayer content, story-focused single-player campaigns, and anything in between. Neverwinter Nights modding scene was popular and enduring, and over a thousand custom adventures were available by the end of the game's first year of release. Aside from all this impressive technical stuff and additional content though, the actual game wasn't half bad either. In the campaign, the player-created protagonist is sent on a quest to retrieve various exotic creatures in order to cure a plague called the Wailing Death that's been devastating the city of Neverwinter and forced a citywide quarantine. Ugh, plague based storylines really hit different nowadays, don't they? Reviewers enthusiastically sang the game's praises upon release, identifying it as a complete package and an RPG that had something to appeal to everyone. Great combat, enchanting visuals for the time, an adequately intriguing story, and fantastic sound design all added up to an adventure for the ages, and the city of Neverwinter went down in gaming history as the second most famous city in Faerun. Not that it's a competition or anything. Number 4. Baldur's Gate, PC, 1998 
If it was a competition though, Baldur's Gate would definitely be winning. Not that you'll be seeing the fabled city for quite some time in Bioware's groundbreaking and genre revitalizing RPG though. No, the story of Baldur's Gate actually starts with the player character doing odd jobs in the walled haven of learning and contemplation known as Candlekeep before they are then forced to flee and survive in the wilderness with only bubbly sidekick Imoen for company. The story quickly escalates into a continent-spanning conspiracy to cause war and bloodshed so that Ball, the Lord of Murder, might be revived, and the protagonist, as well as especially spiky Big Bad Saravok, are both revealed to be said murder god's offspring. Along the way, the player can meet a variety of iconic potential companions of various alignments, and some among them are still enjoying relevancy over 20 years later. It's not just Baldur's Gate's cast that helped it win over the dungeon-delving masses though. With the artful way the game's story unfolds, the best gameplay yet seen in a D&D RPG, the detailed and atmospheric pre-rendered backgrounds, and the levels of customization on offer, all contributing to the game's instant classic status, with an up to six player online multiplayer mode being an added bonus for sociable adventurers. Ironically, for a game whose premise centers on the machinations of the Lord of Murder, Baldur's Gate breathed new life into the struggling CRPG genre and saw Bioware flourish into a legitimate AAA studio. Legendary stuff. Number 3. Planescape Torment, PC, 1999 Developed by Black Isle Studios and designed and written by Chris Avalone, Planescape Torment isn't for everyone. Where the likes of Icewind Dale carved an identity by moving away from role-playing and focusing on combat, Planescape Torment goes in the other direction, with a huge amount of effort put into its dialogue, characters, and world-building, and the combat left as something of an afterthought. It's an oddity, an acquired taste, and the epitome of a cult classic, but it could also unironically be described as a masterpiece of the medium, and one of the greatest stories ever told in game. Gaming. Making use of the Infinity Engine and the dimension-hopping, unashamedly bizarre Planescape setting, Planescape Torment has its own visual style, and offers players a customizable avatar in the form of the Nameless One. This immortal amnesia sufferer wakes up in a mortuary at the start of the game, and it's the player's job to end said immortality by finding out the secrets of the Nameless One's past. This will take players to some very dark and twisty places, and will introduce an unequalled cast of optional party members, including a Gith before Gith were cool, a Tiefling before Tieflings were cool, a chaste succubus, a haunted suit of armor, a burning corpse, a floating skull, and a robot with identity issues and Homer Simpson's voice actor. Universally hailed as one of the all-time greats, Planescape Torment did suffer from occasionally clunky combat, but words are timeless, and the words in this game are some of the very best around. Number 2. Baldur's Gate 2 Shadows of Arm PC 2000 Two years after the release of the original game, Bioware came back with Baldur's Gate 2 Shadows of Arm, and once again shook the foundations of computer RPGs. Taking everything that Baldur's Gate had done so well and making it bigger and better, this anticipated sequel allowed players to transfer their existing character, thus kicking off the adventure at a higher level, which opened avenues for encounters with powerful creatures, extra planar beings, and higher level entities that would have absolutely flattened the party from the first game. The story's antagonist is disgraced elven spellcaster John Erenicus, who plans to use the protagonist's ball spawn status for his own various goals, and has captured them and their companions at the start of the game. Irenicus' dungeon is located in the city of Athcatla, from which players will eventually strike out on a quest filled with twists, betrayals, thieves, vampires, and an isolated prison island specifically intended to hold powerful mages. Reviewers and players alike extolled the virtues of Baldur's Gate 2 Shadows of Arm and pointed out its many improvements over its predecessor, including more meaningful interactions with the party members, shinier visuals, interface and combat tweaks, and some vast and entertaining side quests. Routinely identified as one of the greatest games of all time, Baldur's Gate 2 is truly the stuff of gaming legend. Number 1. Baldur's Gate 3 PC, PS5, and Xbox Series 
2023. It may seem sacrilegious to put this Johnny Come Lately at number one, but as fantastic as its predecessors always will be, they are over 20 years old and are inevitably becoming dated, so a new direction was required. With the likes of Mass Effect Andromeda and Anthem under their fraying belts, BioWare are no longer the masterpiece factory they once were, but Belgian developers Larian Studios seem just about ready to step in to those very big boots. Like an illithid tadpole boring its way into an adventurer's brain, Baldur's Gate 3 has bored its way into the hearts of millions all over the world, and has seized upon the unprecedented current popularity of D&D to become a legitimate phenomenon. Larian have crafted an outstanding adventure that respects the 5th edition D&D rules it's based on, but still knows when to tweak them for optimum gaming enjoyment. It also respects the classic games that came before it without letting that respect hold it back, managing to seamlessly blend old school and modern gaming principles into a near universally adored whole. With its varied and likeable cast of companions, its compelling villains, and its multitude of legitimately tough moral choices, Baldur's Gate 3 creates a captivating narrative for story-focused players to enjoy, and with its intelligent use of the D&D rules, its clever encounter and world design, and its mechanics that lend themselves to the constant emergence of surprising and chaotic situations, it also has the varied gameplay to back up its fascinating premise. It's become a modern classic, with countless reviewers ascending to the rooftops of the nearest Temple of Lathanda to profess their adulation. Dungeons & Dragons is enjoying something of a renaissance period, and video games based on the ever-evolving rule set are more relevant now than they ever have been. Larian's sprawling epic is riding the crest of that wave, and offers an unforgettable adventure second only to the very best tabletop sessions. Baldur's Gate 3 readily deserves its position as the shiniest jewel in the large and varied treasure hoard that is Dungeons & Dragons video games. And that's not just the brain tadpoles talking, we really, really mean it! Now, can I, um, can I talk to you about The Absolute? Do you have a minute? No? Oh, okay. Next time then.